I'm Rob Trusinski. This is Salon of the Refused, where we talk about ideas that are outside the mainstream. My guest today is venerable Washington Post columnist George Will. Uh, thanks for coming on. Glad to be with you. Uh, now, it, talking, I do this as a standard intro for the show where I talk about, we say we talk about ideas that are outside the mainstream, and it, it seems weird in a way to introduce George Will as someone who's outside the mainstream. I mean, you've a very prominent columnist for many decades. Uh, but in a way, we both of us, I think, are, are very much outside the mainstream in the current environment of our partisan politics and, and the, the direction that the right is going at this moment under you know, the rise of Trump, what you might call Trumpism, for lack of a better word. So I guess I want to start with the big question is, what has happened to the right? How did we get here? What is, what is, what is happening to the right-wing or conservative end of the political spectrum? Well, partly because 78,000 or so votes spread over Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania went the way they did, they unleashed a torrent of sociology, some of which is dubious, but the, some of which is interesting, which is to say that there is a, a significant American cohort, nowhere near a majority, but a, a significant cohort that feels that the market society of America has not worked for them or has stopped working for them. And so uh, a number of conservatives have been tempted to say, well, there's something wrong with the market allocating wealth and opportunity. And when you say that, you must say the following. He who says the market is inadequate must say the government is going to be adequate in allocating wealth and opportunity. So we have a kind of statism of the right coming in where we used to have a more libertarian kind of conservatism from Goldwater through Buckley. So I'd say what has happened is a very narrow election return gave large to an enormous intellectual echo. And the echo is to criticize basically the Hayekian spontaneous order understanding of, of the United States as a, a, a lightly governed society in which the government exists to, as the declaration says in so many words, to secure pre-existing rights. First come rights, then comes government. And we've begun to lose sight of that. Now, the question though is that, you know, you said that it's 70,000 vote or so votes spread out among a couple of counties in you know, Pennsylvania and Ohio and things like that. That seems to me almost too, I guess, superficial on explanation because it doesn't explain how it is that Trump got the nomination to begin with. And also how we've seen a lot of people, including many people I know, you know, who are intellectuals and writers on the right, who were dead set against Trump in 2015, 2016. And then suddenly this is the Vox Populi and you know, what's the old saying, uh, there go the people, there go the people, I must follow them for I am their leader. The number of, uh, right-wing intellectuals who have sort of gone along and just jumped totally into the anti-market nationalist uh, variant of Trumpism. So my question, I guess, is what were the things that made the right vulnerable to being co-opted by this? Uh, not just, you know, because of one election, but it seems like it, it fell more easily than, than reluctantly. I think there is a populist temptation built into democratic society. But the populist temptation is to say that the people not only should majority rule, but majorities are right inherently. Uh, that's not what Jefferson and others said. They said majorities should rule when they are right and to the extent that they are right. And we must have a sophisticated constitutional architecture to filter, refine, cool, and delay opinion to make it right, to give it the best chance of being right. Well, what populism does is cuts out all that interesting Madisonian stuff in the middle and says, no, what we need uh, is uh, a, a vocal mass public translating its desires directly to a strong leader who might be someone who says, for example, I alone can fix it. And the more direct the democracy is, the better. This is a complete overthrow of the Madisonian view, of course. And that, in fact, what direct democracy says is right, that there's no more philosophical argument to be had. Right. And, so and this, tempt 
This temptation, I think, is a hardy perennial in, in democracies. Uh, it, it sort of burst upon the scene in the election of 1828 when Andrew Jackson defeated uh, John Quincy Adams, the last uh, connection with the uh, founding generation of deferential politics that it, that it uh, had. And since then, we've had recurring bouts of populism, uh, the most recent one erupting in 2016. You know, the, uh, there's a longstanding trope in the right that I think it's flirted with for a long time of sort of the elites versus real, quote unquote, real America. And it, it is that falling into that populist temptation. And it's, it's been there really, uh, I mean, it's always there in American politics. Uh, everyone has to pretend that, you know, I am a man of the people. Uh, but it seems to have really come to the forefront in recent decades. And <clears throat> uh, one of the questions I had about that is uh, the role of ideas in politics and the role of ideas in the right. Because I remember, just this way, I, uh, I arrived at the University of Chicago in the late 80s about a year after Alan Bloom published the, the um, uh, what is it, The Closing of the American Mind. Yes. And, and that, so when I think of the culture war, that was the culture war we were having in circa 1987, 88. It was about a bunch of conservatives saying, we should be reading the great books and delving into the great ideas of Western civilization. And it seems light years away in a way from uh, the culture war as it is today. Uh, and uh, where it's almost like that first culture war of saying, let's talk about the great ideas, that was lost at some point in some way that we didn't quite notice when it happened. And now that the, the Republican Party or the, the right in general has, has dropped that and just gone full populist. In the late 1970s, Pat Moynihan, who became my very best friend, said something momentous has happened in the United States. The Republican Party has become the party of ideas. <laughs> once you, however, once you decide that elites are the problem and elitism is the problem, without tarrying to define your terms, the first thing you overthrow is intellect. The first thing you overthrow is ideas. Now, I have some grim news for the anti-elitists in the crowd. Mm -hmm. The question in politics is never, will elites rule? It's which elite shall rule? And the problem of democracy, is, as the great Martin Diamond, a wonderful social scientist said, is to get consent to worthy elites. That's the question. Uh, what I don't understand about the, at the heart of the anti-elitism is, are, are they saying we want what? people who are undistinguished, that's nonsense. Of course, people want people who are distinguished. Someone once said to, when Robert Taft, the senator from Ohio, uh, who died in the early 50s, but was known as Mr. Republican, someone once asked uh, uh, Taft's wife, is your husband a common man? And she said, good Lord, no. Manning was first in his class at Yale, first in his class in law school. The American people don't want a common man. And I think she was right about Taft and right about the American people. They may talk in the language of populism because it comes easily. It's a vocabulary laying around like a loaded pistol to be picked up and fired periodically. But actually, the American people don't want that. They want someone like Franklin Roosevelt, someone like uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, who, to the surprise of his culture despisers uh, turned out to be reflective, well-read, et cetera. Yeah, I think one of the uh, um, sort of missed stories, because I remember you know, the way Reagan was portrayed as an amiable dunce, I think was the term somebody used for him. And- Clark, uh, Clark Clifford used that. Uh, right, right. And I, I remember coming across a volume recently about, uh, somebody delved into the history of his the sort of program of self-education that Reagan went on in the 50s uh, while he was a spokesman for GE, that he, you know, all these books that he read and, and uh, uh, he absorbed this tremendous amount of information and knowledge and was extremely well read. And that sort of goes against that idea. You know, he, he was somebody who I think represented that balance of he had the common touch, so to speak, that he could seem like a regular guy and, and appeal to the man on the street, but also at the same time being reflective and thoughtful and having uh, marshalling ideas. 
uh, in favor of his position. And, and that's sort of been the, the angel and the devil on the shoulder of, of the right all along here. But you mentioned that how, you know, the question isn't whether elites uh, are going to be in charge, it's which elites. And the other thing I was thinking is it's also not a question of whether ideas are going to have an impact on our politics. It's a matter of who's going to be out there, you know, in the field promoting and, and working in the realm of ideas. Uh, there's an old saying that, you know, those who don't do politics have politics done to them. And uh, somebody I knew once said, uh, added to that, he says, those who don't do philosophy have philosophy done to them. Uh. I think that's exactly right. The, the simple truth is that, uh, as Keynes said, madmen in authority may not know it, but they are, they are the playthings of defunct economists. Uh, you can broaden that focus a little bit and just say there are ideas out there and they are in the atmosphere, they are absorbed by people, they are taught people, they are encased in the vocabulary of our politics. Uh, and it's better to be aware of them than unaware of them. Know your own premises. And, and it strikes me too, because I know some of the things you've written about this, that in a way, this idea of let's have the great man who represents the will of the people and, and this sort of populist turn, it's almost a form of conservative progressivism. Correct, because otherwise, unless you sort of take charge with ideas and say, these are ideas and I wish to work toward their fulfillment, uh, then, you, then you are going to become a historicist. You're gonna say, where is history going? And am I on the right side of history? That's the trope you most uh, mm -hmm. famously used by progressives in, incessantly by uh, Barack Obama. Uh, if you, once you accept, however, as conservatives should, that history is not teleological, it doesn't know where it's going, uh, it's, it's for us to decide where it's going. Uh, Marx was right about that. He said, hitherto philosophers have interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Now, he, was, he was a great Marxist, a great historicist himself, but the fact is the point is to change the world and, and to jar the world out of this rut and put it in a different, different direction. It can be done. Yeah. And a lot of this goes to you know, the uniqueness of American conservatism, which in a way is it's a paradoxical thing that conservatism is a doctrine that seeks to conserve the existing order that came before, but our existing order was in a way revolutionary and, <clears throat> and, and ideological and based on uh, what was at the time of a very revolutionary enlightenment philosophy. So there's been that, that tension or paradox in conservatism that on the one hand it's backward looking, but it's backward looking to a forward looking philosophy. Quite. Uh, conservatism was born in Europe in reaction to the French Revolution. It was given an articulateness by Burke and his reflections on the revolution in France. But conservatism in Europe is basically backward looking, as you say. It is, there's a certain blood and soil thrown mm -hmm. in all over. Uh, as a, attempt to defend hierarchies. And uh, hence, a resistance to change. When conservatism crossed the Atlantic, conservatives in the United States became the legacies of classic liberalism. Americans, instead of flinching from change, relish it. It's been said that the Bible, reduced to one sentence, is God created man and woman and promptly lost control of events. Uh, I think con American conservatives say, good, we like absence of control because Control usually means the state, and it usually means factions and rent seeking and all the rest. Let's have minimal control, maximum creative destruction, maximum swirl of events, and have fun. But Americans embrace this kind of change. Uh, but you're right, it, conservatism is anchored in a past event, and that is the American founding. Conservatism is about conserving the American founding, which, as you rightly say, is conserving a process and openness to change. And, and specifically also, um, the question I have, though, is about the, the, the use of the word conservatism. And in a way, I think one of the biggest mistakes the right ever made was allowing the left to refer to itself as liberal. Because by, you know, by the time that liberalism came to be used to refer to the left, it was really it was progressivism, which I think is also conceding too much that therefore progress, but it became the party of big government. 
and we said, okay, the people who are in favor of big government, those are the liberals. I think that's a huge mistake. I've never called myself a conservative. I've always said that if I, people understood what I actually meant by it, I would call myself a liberal. Do you think there's any value in sort of reclaiming that label in a way uh, to, to make clear that... Well, you go ahead. In uh, 2019, I published an enormous book called uh, The Conservative Sensibility, mm -hmm. about 565 pages of text. On about the 30th page of which, don't hold me to that, but really early, I said, look, there's a terminological fact. Uh, the war I don't want to have over and over again, but in fact, we conservatives are, among other things, and predominantly the legatees of classic liberalism. John Locke, John Stuart Mill, Lord Acton, uh, Friedrich Hayek, uh, who was at Chicago some years before you, but uh, who, uh, published in the University of Chicago Press, The Constitution of Liberty, the last chapter of which is why I'm not a conservative. He was running the flag up uh, for classic liberalism. Uh, I, know, I know a lost cause, and I see one I've backed enough of them. Uh, so I know that this terminological war is over. Conservatives are going to be called conservatives. Liberals, who are nothing of the sort, are going to be called liberals. Uh, the word liberal meant people whose preoccupation was expanding and defending liberty. And that's not what liberalism is about anymore. So uh, Margaret Thatcher, I suppose, is, is, is as good an example as I can give you of this. She, short, but after she became leader of the Parliamentary Conservative Party, but before she became prime minister, she was at a meeting of her members. And one of them was a net on and on about how ideas aren't important in politics and centrism is the way to go and split the days and all the rest. She reached into her capacious handbag and brought out that thick volume, The Constitution of Liberty by Hayek, slammed it down on the, on the table and said, this is what we believe. Now, if, if it's good enough for Thatcher and Reagan, it's good enough for me. Uh, I, I think that, uh, and as you watch now, as the Josh Hollies and the Marco Rubios and the others who are trying to square the circle by creating what we will call smilingly the Trumpism for the thinking person. <laughs> uh, but what you see, the first thing they have to do is say that capitalism and markets have failed because the allocation of wealth and opportunity isn't optimal. We know what is optimal. Markets don't, aren't necessary to tell us. We know the portion of American life that should be devoted to manufacturing. We know the correct uh, distribution of prosperity from the, uh, the Monongahela Valley of Pennsylvania to the Permian Basin in Texas. We know these things. And the real conservative says, uh, no, no, you don't. Sorry, epistemic humility is part of being a conservative. Understanding the limits to what you can know, because the alternative to that is to stay in Hayekian language, the fatal conceit, the belief that you can know things that you really actually can't know. Now, I think that uh, I've always had a little bit of a problem with the Hayekian thing, because I, I like uh, what Ludwig von Mises, the point he made, which is that the planning of the government regulators is always supplanting the rational planning of millions of private individuals in the economy. So in a sense, it's, it's, it's a, I, I enforce skepticism about what bureaucrats can know uh, and more confidence in what individual people running their own affairs can know. Uh, exactly. If I had one thing that I would have every, college freshman read, it would be Leonard Reed's essay, I Pencil. Yes. The uh, theme of which is, and it's about what, 40 pages long, if that, and it, its theme is no one can make a pencil. Emphasis on the word one. No one can make a pencil because when you unpack it, the graphite miners and lumberjacks and the people who make the rubber for the eraser and who ship all these things and provide the coffee for the workers and the coffee, millions of people go into making a pencil. Uh, and if people can just understand these, not just the daunting complexity, but the creative complexity of modern life, uh, we'd all be a lot better off. 
Now, to make one more pitch about this idea of liberalism, the, the one thing that I find to be the most interesting thing happening currently, uh, interesting in the sense of not necessarily the most important thing, but the one that's most out of what, I, what might be expected, is you've had a group of people who are sort of on the center left, uh, who have come out in, against cancel culture, against political correctness, against the intolerance that you sometimes see on the left. And I, I sort of see a possibility for maybe a kind of ideological coalition or common cause there where liberalism is, you know, there are people on the, on the left who are, you know, the one people, if you ask them who they hate the most, they'll say liberals, right? That liberalism has, it's been rejected to some extent on the left and classical liberalism has been rejected to some extent on the right. And I think it's an interesting question of how much common cause could be found among sort of the more old fashioned uh, uh, pro free speech, pro relatively pro freedom liberals on the, on the center left and those of us who are the sort of class, remaining classical liberals on the right. Well, looking on the bright side as I am disinclined to do, uh, I do think that the, the, there is a kind of physics of our politics, that uh, there's an equal and opposite reaction and the extremism of the cancel culture, the sheer ignorance of the cancel culture, the ludicrousness of the cancel culture. I mean, when they come after Ulysses Grant, uh, you, you know that they, they've lost their sense of their capacity to be embarrassed, which is the beginning of a downfall. And I do think there's going to be uh, uh, there is a, a, a very responsible, large cohort of, of uh, liberals in the way that's commonly used in our current parlance. Sean Lalentz, historian of Princeton, to take just one example, um, who are going to fight the good fight for their New Deal Democrats, Great Society Democrats, but they are they are small D Democrats as well, and they are people who believe in in again the principles of the founding. I mean, the, the American founding, they, didn't, they neither anticipated nor desired political parties. They ratified the Constitution in 1789, and, and by 1799, we got political parties because people tend to differ and they tend to cluster, and we call those clusters parties, and we argue it out. Uh, what made the, the 1800 presidential election the most important election in the history of the planet is that it was the peaceful transfer of power from one faction to another. And they didn't like each other. Jefferson in his uh, inaugural address in 1881 said, we're all Federalists, we're all uh, uh, Republicans. Nonsense. There was a lot of bitterness out there, and it was in his interest to pretend it wasn't so. But uh, it, it, was, uh, it was an interesting pretense that in well, fact... Yeah. Uh, I just had a discussion um, about... Uh, Donald Trump's comments on the election about, you know, will you accept a peaceful transfer of power? And he couldn't bring himself to just say yes and leave it at that. And one of the things that came up in that is that, you know, we have a sort of a set of civic rituals in this country, things that you're supposed to say uh, that even, even if you don't mean them, it's important that people say them because it establishes a certain expectation. And we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans, is one of these sort of early examples of the, the proto example of one of those sort of civic uh, rituals, which is you have to pretend we all have more in common as Americans. We have more in common than what divides us. Which is actually true, by the way, <laughs> for the vast majority of Americans. Uh, the people out on the, on the far fringes, those on the one hand, on the right, the people who think every election really is a Flight 93 election, that uh, this is the, all that stands between us and, and Bolshevism, or on the, on the left to believe that uh, uh, America is saturated with racism and, and uh, it's hardly worth saving and pretty late to saving. It's all rubbish to most Americans who, who are, are busy uh, washing the car and men in the screen door and raising children and getting on with life. Uh, this, this shrillness, I think it's important to, to remember that about 330 million people in this country and at any given moment about 325 million of them are not watching cable television and not listening to talk radio and not participating in this this uh shrill back and forth right and especially the number of people the number of people who are not on twitter I, th I think twitter actually i mean it's fashionable to bash twitter i think the effect it's had has been that uh everybody who's in the political media is on twitter and they're all talking to each other on Twitter, and it puts them more into the bubble of 
what's going on on Twitter is what's actually happening in the American deliberative public debate when it's not representative of what you know the the average person is actually talking about or thinking about. Exactly right. I, I would I do not know how to tweet. Uh, someone in my office twice a week tweets 280 characters or whatever it now is yeah. from my two columns a week. But beyond that, I don't know. I, I, I never read a tweet. I just, it's, life's too short. There are too many books to read. It, it's, yeah, I've, I sort of, I, I have a love and hate relationship with it because it's sort of necessary if you're a writer now and you want to get attention and you want to get editors interested in what you have to say. But at the same time, I recognize that it's a waste of time in, in large respect and that distorting impact it has on how you view the political debate uh, actually stacking up. Um, now, one of the things I want to talk about, though, is, is we talked about how conservatism has changed with, in the last four years. But the question also is, have, have you changed? Because I know you said you've become more libertarian as you've gone on. I have become more libertarian in the sense that uh, I'm much more sensitive to the fact that as government becomes more intrusive and regulatory, as the administrative state metastasizes, it does not just make rent seeking possible and crony capitalism possible. It makes it necessary. It's an incitement to rent seeking, by which I mean bending public power to private advantage. Uh, occupational licensing is the classic example. In, in order to, to become a, a, a hair braider, you have to go to cosmetology school in some states for two years and pay $15,000 and jump through all kinds of hoops, all in order to restrict entry into the into a profession to help uh, rent seeking on the part of those in the profession on the step. So my, I have become much more sensitive than I used to be to the ways in which a, a regulatory state, what we now call the administrative state, can be turned to these, these advantages. That's one way in which I've changed. Another way is, and I owe this bit of my education to Mr. Trump. Uh, I, on the one hand, I think the, the uh, modern presidency has become grotesque uh, in, as, in, in producing a, a vast disequilibrium in what should be the equilibrium of our Madisonian architecture in which Congress would still be. I mean, it's, the, it's Article One of the Constitution for a reason. Madison is one of my heroes, but the one thing he got wrong was he said that uh, all power tends to be sucked into the impetuous vortex of the legislature. Not true. The Congress has spent the last 80 years or so expelling its powers, hurling them off, uh, delegating them to presidents who now have enormous discretion to do almost anything they want if they simply declare an emergency. Uh, so, so on the one hand, I've been worrying about the executive, how to cage the executive as, as uh, is put in a, in a new book uh, by a University of Virginia law professor. But on the other hand, what Donald Trump has taught me is the enormous coarsening power that a president can have just by his manners or want thereof, just by his rhetoric. Uh, you cannot unring a bell and you can't unsay the things he has said. And in less than four years, he has changed dramatically, I won't say irrevocably, but dramatically and for the long term, he has changed the way we speak and the way we use words. And it's all been at enormous cost to the comity and collegiality of American life. And at the end of the day, to the trust Americans have in one another. And if there, we've learned one thing about modern society is that nations with a high level of trust prosper, and those with a, high, with a low level of trust don't. Yeah, one of the uh, arguments I've always gotten about you know, people who are supporting Trump is they say, well, you object, don't object to his policies, you object to his manner. And I think they uh, ignore the extent to which the manner and style and his, his way of speaking and his way of doing things has a substantive effect, that it's not yeah. just superficial. Yes, the, the, the Trump can say, well, yes, of course, he's a boor and a lout and all the rest, but he's our boor and our lout, and but Gorsuch, and he's done some good things. No question he's done good things. Uh, 
the, the problem is that what they say, well, these are merely aesthetic considerations. And I say, yes, and aesthetics matter a great deal, it turns out, uh, because they, they shape the, the, the soul of the country. Uh, aesthetics, uh, beauty has its function in life, and there's such a thing as beautiful public rhetoric, as Lincoln showed us, and, and others have shown us, as Franklin Roosevelt showed us, as Jack Kennedy showed us. Uh, so as Barack Obama showed us that uh, rhetoric is, is, uh, is, is not a, a mere ornament. It is an instrument of governance. It's an instrument of persuasion. And after all, that's what democracy is. It, it, it's, it's a system that celebrates the possibility of persuasion. And also, you know, the, what people forget is that we, we have a system where power changes hands. And we want it to be able to change hands because if it couldn't change hands, it would be an autocracy. But power changes hands. And, and I, I was amazed at the way that people will scheme. Uh, you know, Barack Obama spent eight years scheming to create more powers for the executive so they could be, without thinking that maybe this office is going to be uh, occupied by somebody I despise. And the same thing I, I find to be the problem with the, the people who support Trump on his manner is that you know, they're basically saying it's okay to, uh, to coarsen the discourse in order, if the person that we're, that we like is in charge, but not thinking about, well, what will happen after that? What will happen when somebody else comes in on the other side who does not hold to those, who doesn't hold to those standards either? And where is that going to go for us as a society? And the people who say, well, yes, Trump's a vulgarian, but he's done these good things. They fail to explain why the Bulgarian side of him is necessary. Any Republican president would have cut the corporate tax rate. Barack Obama wanted to cut the corporate tax rate. Any Republican president would have selected his judicial nominees from lists provided by people like, if not the Federalist Society, people like the Federalist Society. So what he's done with these people like is utterly independent of, of what makes Mr. Trump distinctive, which is the vulgarity, the coarseness, the, the, the incontinent lying to no purpose much of the time. Yeah, I would point out that the, the last thing, significant thing I've seen that, that's been done to control federal spending was done by John Boehner, who was considered the uh, epitome of the, you know, uh, the weak establishment Republican politician, but you know, the, he's, he instituted the sequester was the only major attempt at control of federal spending in the last 20 years. Yes, and the sequester actually came about because Barack Obama made the mistake of allowing Joe Biden to negotiate with Mitch McConnell, and that was a mismatch of historic dimensions. <laughs> uh, now, one other thing I wanted to ask about, because it's something that is uh, close to me as well, which is that you are, you describe yourself as a, a I think, a low voltage atheist. Uh, amiable voltage atheist, yes. <laughs> Amiable, there you go. Um, that, that's sort of, I, I kind of describe myself to some extent the same way, not necessarily low voltage, but amiable. Uh, that is not, you know, I, I come across some atheists who it's like, well, you know, there's still, the, the, the most melted atheists I met are people who went to Catholic school. And you could tell there's something in their manner that they're still getting back at the nuns. Uh, and I, I didn't grow up with that background, so I'm able to be a little more low-key about it. But it is something that's unusual on the right, especially today with, you know, I think since Reagan, really, an increasing number of appeals to religion as uh, the basis for the right. So how do you square the circle of being both a conservative and an atheist? Well, first, I think Bill Buckley put it well. Bill, of course, was a devout Catholic. Uh, but Bill asked me to be his first Washington editor of National Review. Uh, he, he knew that he had to get along with people of all sorts. And he said, a conservative need not be religious, but a conservative cannot despise religion. And I think right on both counts. Uh, I believe religion is poetry. I believe the great religions are poems that are never going to be finished being written. Uh, they express permanent aspects of uh, human longings and aspirations and curiosities. Great religions explain, uh, console, and enjoin, uh, which is why deism, by the way, is not a religion. 
the theism of the founders, they said, well, uh, the, the great clockmaker of the universe wound it up and let it go, and then he absconded. And uh, that's fine as an explanation, but it, religions also do more than explain. They console, as I say, and they enjoin. They tell you to do certain things. Uh, my grandfather was a Lutheran minister. My father, his son, used to sit outside Pastor Will's office in uh, Western Pennsylvania and listen to the pastor and some of his more thoughtful uh, parishioners try and reconcile the doctrine of free will and grace. Uh, this kind of uh, concern turned my father into a philosopher, quite secular. I grew up in an entirely secular family. There was no hostility to religion. religion. The idea of religion just never came up. Uh, and I'm just not wired in a way that that bothers me. Other people are. Bless them. Uh, I've got no problem with that. I'm married to a ferocious Presbyterian. Uh, so uh, I've never heard the phrase ferocious Presbyterian before. I just have to say. Well, I, I gather there are factions within the Presbyterian community, and that, that there's a ferocious one, and she's in it. <laughs> my, my, parents, yeah. my, my parents my parents are in the non-ferocious uh, faction of Presbyterians. Uh -huh. Jeffersonian, and if my, he said, my, if my neighbor believes in one God or 20 gods or no God, it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. And that's the way I feel. Right. Uh, now, we've talked to me. When, when say, I, let me add, add this. Uh, when I get, do get a little bit cross is when Whitaker Chambers says, a man without mysticism is a monster. And I say, well, that makes me a monster, my father a monster, and, and that seems to me a bit rude. Uh, or when Russell Kirk says that uh, a real conservative uh, stares into the burning bush and all that stuff, nonsense, not true. I'm sorry, I think, I think David Hume, one of my intellectual pinups, was uh, a good conservative and uh, not a theist. Uh, does does not being a believer though does it have an effect in terms of which conservative policies you uh, you back or which ones you emphasize? No, none whatever. I'm pro life because I believe life begins, and this is this is not medieval theology. This is high school biology. Life begins at conception, and uh, should be respected. Uh, I don't need uh, you know people who who have a theological grounding of their pro-life views, good for them. Uh, welcome to the fight, but it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, now, the last thing I want to talk about is, is uh, the, I talked about this culture war that was sort of lost somehow in the 80s and 90s about, you know, how conservatism was about the great books and the big ideas. You know, it's the loss of a certain amount of intellectualism. And I think that, you know, it's, it's like in pursuing being the democratic party of the common man, that the Republicans, I mean, there, there was a combination of that that you used to have, like under Reagan, where you had, you could reach out to the common man, and that, but then you would also read the works of, of Hayek and read the works of the intellectuals. Uh, or, you know, the thing that strikes me is that typically at a, at a Republican president or a pre any president is running for office, he'll go give the barn burner speech to the big rally, and then he'll also go give a talk to a think tank where he lays out his program and platform for the sake of the intellectuals. And, and Trump is the sort of the first president we've had in a long time who doesn't do that, who talks only to the big rallies and ignores the intellectuals and sort of despises and disregards the intellectuals. And I guess the question is, how do we bring that sort of intellectualism back into politics and back to the right? You know, one of the things in, in and every time you hear George Will mentioned, the word erudite seems to come up. And because you use, you use full, complete, complex sentences and college level vocabulary, which in these days, you know, counts as great erudition. And uh, the, uh, you know, because the standards have been lowered so much. So how do we bring that kind of intellectualism and regard for ideas and regard for education and the idea of conservatism being a doctrine of intellectuals and not just of populists, how do, we, how do we bring that back? You do it in two stages. First, you say we are not populists. Whatever else we are, we are not populists. We do not believe in the unmediated and spontaneous wisdom of the people. We just don't. Uh, 
life's, life's too short to believe in soothing fictions like that. But then we, uh, we say the following. Conservatives complain a lot, and rightly so, because they have been so often marginalized or excluded from the media, entertainment, academia, etc. But the good side of that is that conservatives, just as you would expect, saw an unserved constituency in the intellectual marketplace and created their own institutions. The great think tanks, American Enterprise Institute, Heritage, Cato Foundation, uh, Mount Pelerin Society, all kinds of things sprang up uh, spontaneously, but uh, with a little, lot of help from a lot of devoted people to produce an alternative intellectual infrastructure. And it's still out there. Uh, the, the barriers to entry into the, uh, the printed word commentary are zero now, thanks to the internet. So uh, I, I think conservatives uh, know how to do this. And once Mr. Trump is gone, which I expect him to be shortly, uh, and people are going to see that, you know, just as George Wallace was a, a big deal in the United States in 68 until he got shot in 1972. And after he left the scene, there was no Wallaceism left. It just went away. Uh, Ross Perot got 19.7% uh, of the popular vote in 1992. He left the public stage. There was no Perotism left. There were, there, there were these vivid personalities, Perot, Trump, Wallace, and when the personalities are gone, the emptiness echoes. And uh, the emptiness is empty because there's no ballast of ideas, really. Well, there you go for once being more optimistic than me. Uh, I, I think it's going to leave a long shadow because he's going to inspire a lot of imitators. But I, I think, you know, in a way this ties in, though, to the conservative insight of the importance of institutions. So what you're basically saying is there's an institutional infrastructure to conservatism. Uh, that persists and will sort of reassert itself uh, into the vacuum that, that, that is left after, after Trump goes off the scene? Well, I, I, there are a number of interesting people out there. I'm just going to cite one. Uh, so Nikki Haley is very accomplished. She's had diplomatic experience. She's a two-term governor of, uh, of a state, a wonderful uh, governor of South Carolina, where I am speaking to you from. Ah. Uh, now, Nikki Haley gave a terrific speech, everyone ought to Google it up and read it, to the Hudson Institute a few months ago in Washington, one of the conservative think tanks, uh, in an issue with the Josh Hawley, Marco Rubio kind of despair about capitalism. On the other hand, Nikki Haley has uh, shown some sort of Trumpist temptations. We're just going to have to wait and see who, uh, who the adults in the room are after the child has left the room. Well, and, and when it comes to Nikki Haley being sort of saying some Trumpist things, I mean, it's a politician being a politician, uh, doing what she needs to do to stay popular with the base during this moment. I, I've, I kind of don't, I, I have a policy of not expecting too much from politicians in the, uh, uh, in the hope that then I won't be too let down <laughs> by them inevitably. Uh, but I do place more confidence in the idea that there are people like uh, like you and people like the you know the various intellectuals at the, at the think tanks who are out there who will who do have an ideology that creates some continuity um, and I, I think you know in a way we were I was spoiled by you know growing up in the Reagan era and Reaganism was as at its as descendants of Reaganism and the the fear that I have is that you know, the, the Reagan sort of ideological combination, we associate it with a politician, but it was a, a larger intellectual movement that came together in, you know, the 60s and 70s and had its high point with uh, an influence for about 20 years, you know, during Reagan's administration and afterwards. To what extent was that a maybe historical ac accident or something that was temporary historically? What were the conditions that made it possible for that to happen? And will it bounce back you know, after this blow sort of to it? Well, the opposite of historical accident is historical necessity. And since mm -hmm. I believe there are very few of those, I'll call it an accident. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it required a particular person with enormous political talents, 
uh, one of which was to disguise uh, his intellectual side somewhat. Uh, so what we need are, we need people. We need, uh, not a lot of them, we need a conservative, to use the nasty word, we need conservative elites to come back and act like elites, confident, wise, experienced, unapologetic about their possession of uh, certain wisdom, learning, hard acquired ideas, uh, eloquently defended. Don't need a lot of people like this, but you need some. Well, let's hope that you're right, that we're gonna get someone, and, and think you're right, the, the, it, it is to some extent an accident, or not so much an accident, but it requires a certain amount of luck to have the right person at the right time who takes the right ideas and takes the environment that's permissive for those ideas and goes with them. I'm hoping we can re refine that person again after some uh, <laughs> period of wandering in the desert, uh, which hopefully won't last for too long. Well, I want, to, I want to thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about this and sort of helping to reason through this. I mean, I, 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 this may, I might be a little annoying to say this, but I, I actually, I grew up reading George Will columns. Uh, you know, it's a coming, coming of age in the 1980s during that ascendancy of that, uh, of that version of conservatism. And so it, it means a lot to be able to talk to you about this and reason through where we're going uh, uh, from here. Well, uh... As I say, I'm not accustomed to looking on the bright side. And, and if you flanked me from on the pessimistic side, I've let myself down here. But uh, I, I have two uh, on my phone. I have two photographs of my wallpaper. One is of Madison, uh, who gave us the architecture, and the other is of Lincoln. And it's Lincoln in 1858, pre-beard. Looks like a very young man. And that's the year of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. That was the year that uh, uh, Lincoln's ascent to greatness began. Uh, and uh, a nation that can produce those people, we don't need Madisons all the time. We don't often need Lincolns. But every once in a while, we do really need someone, and we get them. History did not serve up on a silver salver Martin Luther King. Uh, the United States got him. I don't know why, but we got him, and, and he, he got us, with, he provided the vocabulary and the manners to get us through an extremely difficult and glorious period, the Civil Rights Revolution. So I, I think it's premature to decide that the fecundity of American life is exhausted and that we're not going to produce Madisons and Lincolns and Franklin Roosevelt's and Ronald Reagan's and Martin Luther King's again, we will. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for agreeing to talk with me. I enjoyed it very much, we'll do it again. This is Salon of the Refuse. My guest today has been George Will, uh, Washington Post columnist for many, many years now. Uh, if you enjoy uh, the ideas and uh, discussion in this uh, video, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can uh, subscribe to the podcast, uh, which is available on Google Play and iTunes and elsewhere. And uh, you can always find more ideas and analysis at the Trzinski Letter, www.trzinskiletter.com. I'm Rob Trzinski. Thanks for listening.